Let's see. Uh, Kristen says, uh, Robin Nikki loved the first Q&A back. I wanted to ask an expansion on the FTO gene polymorphism question. I myself also ran my 23andMe data through Found My Fitness as a Rhonda Patrick follower, and I have the similar FTO, well, several FTO genes came up, but also the PPAR alpha gene came up that I know is a big part of ketosis. My question is, can I attempt a keto diet and ketosis with using mainly polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids and still achieve ketosis with this polymorphism, or am I better off to not focus on going keto? Thank you for all that you put in the world. I just received your book, Wired to Eat, and started reading it and love it so far. Look at you. That money you spent on your education paid off. <laughs> super, super impressed. Uh, so Wait, my, my pronunciation or what? <laughs> Something like that. I mean, the fact that you know poofas and mufas, although oh, you've, you've hung out with me for a little bit. So, a little while. so this is a great question, and I think we talked about this a little bit, like some of my own polymorphisms right. in the the first Q and A setup. And so, I'm going to toggle through a couple of of uh, studies in the future. Um, so this this recording is going to go out both as a regular audio podcast and then also in this video format. If folks feel like seeing these studies, I'm going to link to them in the show notes so you guys can pull them up. But if you feel like seeing the studies would be helpful, then I will share screen. Where we share screen next time. and yeah. kind of do just, audio just let me that. know. I'm trying to keep it kind of simple, but but if you feel like that would be valuable, then for sure we can do it. But again, all of this stuff will be in the show notes. So digging into the the FTO gene, and I, I kind of want to look at this. Um, there's kind of a front end part of this story and then a back end part of the story. And the FTO kind of deals with the the front end and then the PPR alpha deals with the back end. And the, the front end of this is really looking at some of the evolutionary adaptations that occurred that brought about the FTO gene kind of, kind of experience. And a lot of what's associated with that is a, a tendency toward accumulating fat mass. So that FTO gene is highly correlated or reasonably well correlated with saturated fat intake and a tendency towards gaining body fat. Now, these studies, though, are interesting because it's always in kind of a, a mixed diet, Western population. People are not eating what I would call in a, you know, a, a species specific diet. So that's where this stuff gets a, a little bit, you know, a little bit squirrely to to pin down all the, the pieces. But um, definitely there is some association there with increased saturated fat intake and a tendency towards obesity and insulin resistance. Um, <laughs> I always like to pull things up and, and uh, you know, any given topic and do the following search term, which is, let's say we're interested in the FTO gene. So I would put in FTO gene evolutionary advantage and see what we get from that. Like, it's just super helpful to dig into what people are talking about with regards to the evolutionary advantage might be for something. And around this, uh, there's a great paper thinking evolutionarily about obesity. And again, this will be linked in the show notes. But it's making this case around the thrifty gene hypothesis, which uh, posits that um, our whole species has been wired to deal with periods of starvation. Now, there are pieces of the thrifty gene hypothesis which have been kind of borne out over time. But one of the challenging features of the story is that if you really dig into our ancestral past, we didn't have extended periods of starvation as hunter gatherers. And so. There's actually some, you know, as with everything in science, like the thrifty gene hypothesis was pretty powerful for a while, but it wasn't too long after its release that some pretty serious criticisms popped up on it. But there is clearly a tendency for us to accumulate fat mass. Uh, we are the the most fat retentive primate on the planet, and and a lot of that has to do with our big brains and this ability to shift in and out of ketosis is one of the buffer elements to to this whole story um we see other organisms that have very large brain to body mass they also tend to default into a ketogenic state during periods of fasting or, or caloric restriction what what have you so that's another piece of the fto gene another part of this bigger overall story is this thing called the constrained energy hypothesis which is really fascinating this stuff came from uh, Herman Ponser and his group. And what they did is a, a number of years ago, I think 2012, they released this study, but it had been assumed that hunter-gatherers burned more energy than Westerners 
uh, on a daily basis because of their activity level, but nobody had actually tested this. So they got in and tested this hypothesis that, that because these folks were more active that they burn more total calories throughout the day and they did a very rigorous study. It gets a lot of criticism within the low carb community because a lot of folks are really attached to this, uh, you know, like calories in, calories out don't matter. And clearly there's a lot more nuance to it. Calories matter, hormones matter, the whole goddamn story matters, which is part of the problem of unpacking all this stuff. So this constrained total energy story actually relates to um, uh, if if an organism, and, and this appears to be across all vertebrates, like uh, everything that they've tested, well, maybe not all vertebrates, they're not sure if it uh, works in cold-blooded animals like amphibians and reptiles, but it definitely holds true for mammals, marsupials, and avians. So anything warm-blooded. And what happens is when these critters or us, if our energy output extends beyond a certain por uh, uh, level, we actually don't burn more calories throughout the day. What ends up happening is a bunch of the calories that are normally devoted to maintenance and growth are just d deleted, basically. So uh, during periods of extremely high work output, the, the total energy capacity that, that we are burning doesn't really expand or expand linearly. It, it actually kind of flatlines at some point, which is really kind of mind blowing. This is also, and we might maybe should do a whole podcast just around this topic. But although exercise is really important, it appears again to mainly be important for health, uh, uh, that exercise and gene expression so paper from Frank Booth. Running five miles every single day or, you know, your body adapts to that at some point twice a day, three times yeah. a day. If you're doing it for a fat loss, if you're trying to do it for approach. fat loss, it's really not going to work. Hmm. And, and th th you know, anecdotally, we've kind of seen this and I know for myself, if I exercise more, I definitely can buffer my, my relative leanness, but I'm not doing massive amounts of work. And th there appears to be this kind of middle ground where some increased or decreased physical activity does move the needle a little bit. But when you're trying to do that, like three CrossFit sessions a day, plus mm -hmm. hot yoga, plus a hike, like at some point, what you end up sacrificing is recovery and growth. And this is where people end up with chronic injuries and they're depressed and their gut becomes damaged. Yeah. So there's all these problems mm -hmm. and I will tie all this stuff back together. I know that there's a, a lot going on here. So finally, this thing is really kind of going out it, on the, the edge a little bit. And again, this will be in the show notes, but it's a paper on energy balance and game theory based cluster formation method for wireless sensor networks. Okay. <laughs> so sensor net wireless sensor networks have to manage the, the input and outputs of both the wireless signal and also the energy that they are consuming. And although this may seem like a really far afield topic to apply to human nutrition, <laughs> But this game theoretic model is really critical in understanding allocation of resources. And this is ultimately what we're talking about here. So this FTO gene is all about allocation of resources and it's all about uh, uh, this, this tendency towards increasing fat mass for some people. Part of this story also relates to the type of lipoproteins that are produced in response to different fatty acid intakes. So, MUFAs and PUFAs tend to not elevate LDLP, LDLC, light, uh, the LD, uh, low density lipoprotein particles and the, the associated cholesterol, whereas saturated fat does. And I think we talked about this before, under different circumstances, that elevation may be really, really nasty, or it may be relatively benign. Like if we're in a low carbohydrate, low inflammatory state, it may not be that big of a deal Although there are people that just completely dismiss uh, lipoprotein elevations out of hand, I think that that's not right. But then other people try to make the case that uh, a, a, a high insulin load, high carbohydrate individual with elevated lipoproteins is the same as somebody who's low insulin load, low inflammation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those two things really aren't, aren't easily overlapped. But in the front end of this story, this FTO gene is really looking at resource allocation and some responses to that. And folks that have certain FTO gene polymorphisms may have lower lipoproteins and, and would likely tend to have lower lipoproteins if they did more of what we would call like a Mediterranean paleo type intervention or Mediterranean keto. So no huge drama there. But so on the front end, you if you have one of these gene polymorphisms related to FTO, 
you can make the decision about, okay, I'm going to have more or less saturated fat based off that polymorphism. And there's going to be consequences to that related to insulin sensitivity or resistance and also lipoproteins. Okay, longest answer to like the shortest question ever. So the other part of this relates to the PPR alpha gene, which is the peroxisome peripholator activated receptor. Alpha is a, a gene that is activated in response to various fatty acids and also certain drugs can activate this, this gene complex. And what its importance is, is sensing the amount and types of different fatty acids that are flowing through our system and then shuttling those kind of in the appropriate direction metabolically. People with uh, the PPR alpha genotype, which I, I have that, we can mobilize fatty acids pretty effectively and this shouldn't be an inhibiting factor in entering ketosis. The PPR, PPAR gamma genotype tends to have some problems dealing with those fatty acids. Mm. And so these individuals might do better with a moderate to high protein, uh, a lower fat, monounsaturated fat, uh, potentially even um, uh, MCTs if you kind of wanted to drive the boat that direction because it bypasses the, the bulk of this stuff. So it, it, based off of, what was the Kristen. girl's name again, Kristen? So Kristen, sorry, this is such a long drawn out deal. Um, we probably have like literally, literally the down to six listeners on this. But what, it, what I'm taking from this is depending on what your specific FTO genotype is and then that PPAR alpha genotype is, ketosis shouldn't be a problem at all. And also uh, you can certainly uh, do some, some diligence on what your lipoprotein response and insulin sensitivity or resistance response is to different fatty acid types. So again, like the longest <laughs> answer ever. Apologies for that, but I wanted to do some some diligence on that one. Oh, and just as an aside, there are other SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, like the CPT1, the carnitine palmitoyl transferase gene uh, alteration that we see in far northern populations, which doesn't even allow them to enter ketosis. Mm. And so individuals with that genotype, which again, unless you're Inuit or from the, the uh, folks in Siberia that live off of reindeer and stuff like that, like it's highly unlikely that you have this genotype but this uh, CPT1 uh, uh, polymorphism um, has enhanced the ability to directly use free fatty acids as an energy source and actually bypasses the ability to produce ketones at all. Again, I think we. This is what you talk about in your talk. This is what you're I talk about. For paleo effects, your yeah, yeah, the metabolic talk. flexibility. That's where I, I, I was like, I was just talking about this recently, yeah. but I, I can't, re couldn't <laughs> yeah. remember. So if but if you're going to paleo effects, you will. Palo FX, Low Carb USA down in San Diego. Um, I'll be talking about that. But this is an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, study on as powerful as ketosis is, biology found an example, found a situation in arguably a, a population that eats as ketogenic a diet mm -hmm. as you could find. And it actually found an evolutionary advantage to not enter ketosis. And uh, mm -hmm. even though infant mortality rates increased by uh, three times, uh, hypoglycemia being the, the primary driver of that increased uh, infant mortality rate. Despite all that, the ability to generate more heat via uh, uh, uncoupling proteins and to directly use fats instead of uh, relying on, on ketone uh, production, that was a really powerful, it's one of the fastest spreads of a genetic variant in all of human history. The only thing that's kind of on par with it is sickle cell anemia. Mm. So kind of kind of interesting or perfect cure for insomnia, depending on where you're, you're at with that stuff.